Richard will be taking questions um, and we'll be using the Slido tool for that. Um, we'll be putting a link in the message bar so you can post your questions ready for the end of the, the presentation. This webinar is brought to you by Synesthesia and it is powered by AWS Amplify. Thank you, Richard. Have a great webinar. Thanks. Thanks, Lucy. Um, thanks for everybody for hanging on. Um, one of these days, humans will be better at uh, organizing times, I guess. Um, and uh, it's interesting because that's actually um, one of the things that I'm going to talk a little bit about today. Um, and uh, today, uh, as Lucy mentioned, I'm going to talk about um, uh, basically data synchronization in uh, mobile apps, specifically Android, um, whether you're building real time or offline apps. And the way I'm going to talk about this is I'm going to talk about a client framework that we've built at AWS, and I'm going to uh, talk about um, some of the industry specific, um, or rather I should say open source things that we've built into this. And I'm going to talk about, uh, technologies and techniques in the general sense. Um, the, the, the answers to the technology, I'm going to talk about how we tackled them at AWS, but I'm going to give a bit of an overview to the kind of problem space as, as a whole and, and some of the things that we did, um, just so like you have a background on. Uh, the problems with with real time or offline apps when you're trying to to do make collaborative applications or synchronization and things like that, um, and and the way that you'll see this in how we implemented this in the Amplify framework is uh, we actually use categories that that customers can program against, um, and and what this gives you is kind of a general way to work in a category of abstraction, um, and our our categories are are use case based. So, for example, in the Amplify components, um, the actual components of the framework, it comes down to three big pieces. So um, we have libraries, uh, we have UI components, and then we have a CLI tool chain uh, that does a lot of the, the kind of heavy lifting of the machinery under the covers, especially for the back end uh, pieces, like uh, standing up APIs and databases and so forth. Today, I'm going to focus on the Android side, uh, specifically the libraries that that you can leverage to build a Java or Kotlin based applications. I'm going to show you some Kotlin code today for this. Uh, and the category that I'm going to focus on is Amplify Data Store. Um, but it is good to know a little bit about the Amplify framework just going into this, because as you look at this in time, um, you'll see that we have other categories as well that are pretty interesting, things like analytics or uh, storage, for example. Um, we also have a, a very large uh, customer base around the, the authentication uh, category. Uh, for doing fine-grained auth in your apps, both auth and auth C, and providing secure access to your resources. Uh, but today, uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, is an area of development um, when it comes to kind of app requirements when when people are building uh, applications that that tend to overlap in functionality quite a bit, uh, even though you might not realize it at first. Um, so some of these might be applications that require low latency interactions, so like banking, multiplayer games, chat, shared whiteboards. And uh, these were these were types of applications that that we, we heard in the past and we still hear quite a bit that we've got customers building, um, especially when you think of like today's uh, um, situation that we're in globally around um, being disconnected from each other. These are these are really important. Um, but similarly, we talked to a lot of customers about uh, offline scenarios for either, you know, transitions of state between different geographical locations, or if they're in remote areas of the world that might have a little bit poor infrastructure. And uh, what's interesting as we as we dive deep deeper into these these different areas, um, if you take something like chat, uh, this actually has applications for when you want to be offline and optimistically send messages to another person, or when you're online, for example or even news articles, right? You might want to comment on them. And then when you come back online, have data synchronized. And this ends up being a pretty challenging problem to solve. So what are we going to cover today? Well, um, we're going to cover uh, the problems with the traditional programming models when you are building applications for online or online sync or offline. Um, even, even if it's online, right, uh, you're never going to get any faster communication than and effectively a, a store locally on your device. I'll, I'll talk about that term in a second, what I mean by stores. Um, 
We're going to talk about some problems with concurrency, especially around correctness uh, and how to can handle conflicts. And this will arise whenever you have multiple actors in a system or, or devices that are operating over the same data. To, we're going to talk about how we solved this uh, with GraphQL inside of uh, Amplify. Um, there's multiple ways. GraphQL is not necessarily the, the only uh, way to, to solve this. We just uh, rally around this this technology because it's an open uh, open standard that that anyone can implement. Okay, so looking at uh, this problem a little bit deeper, like I mentioned, I want to talk about mental models at first in programming. Now, uh, if you're if you've developed mobile or web apps, and you've even if you haven't built an offline application, but you built a let's say a cache. Um, because you wanted to to reduce the the round trip latency between server and backend, right? You'll never have anything closer than the some some uh, some record set on your device, and this is effectively the mental model that most developers think of. They they kind of put a, a keyed value into uh, an array or a hash map or something like that, um, and then you know maybe that array or that dictionary they they iterate over when they want to render some some information to their screen, and and this kind of holds true in in uh, web apps and hybrid apps and native apps on Android and iOS. And it's a really nice mental model. But it tends to break down uh, due to some, uh, some, some trickiness around how you're actually storing data on the device and then properties uh, from, a, from a computer science standpoint over the network. So the, one of the reasons uh, fundamentally it breaks down is something known as the CAP theorem. And if you've not spent a lot of time in back-end distributed systems, you might not have heard of this, and I'd recommend you actually look this up sometime. Um, but if you're not familiar, this is something known as Brewer's Theorem, um, came from a, a gentleman that works at Google. And uh, by and large, the, the theory states that if you, if you have a, a distributed system or a system on a network with multiple nodes, so that's to say that it has partitions, a uh, network partition exists, um, you have to choose between one of two other things. Either your system can be consistent with the data in it, it means that uh, you, you have properties like you can read your writes and, um, and you don't have different results depending on which host you hit, um, or it can be highly available. Right? And you usually uh, build systems either like AP or CP systems uh, where you, have, you, have, you choose two. Um, so this is, this is kind of like where the theorem uh, has, has gone to fruition. Um, but when you have a mobile or web app, um, you you really usually don't have a choice, right? Uh, because of the 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 state of the system, just from a physical perspective. So what do I mean by this? So I mentioned um, you have this concept of partitions, and and this is effectively what I mean when I'm talking about distributed systems on the back end and and something being available. Uh, but with a mobile app, uh, you have the ultimate network partition, and that's from the client to the back end. But there's some other things in common as well if you start to look at these systems, right? They, they all usually have a database of some sort or store. Um, and then if we want to uh, reduce the latency of the overall system, right, we tend to put caches in place. Now, many times these caches and stores, and this is an important point, are, are uh, treated the same when it comes to your mobile client, right, because you don't have a uh, partition there locally. They also have some other things in common, um, such as queues, for example. And this is important because it's how you are going to decouple your system and, and handle incoming and outgoing events. And these techniques, uh, or, or rather I should say these components of the system, um, end up having similar properties between the client and backend. Let's look at the, the caches or the stores first. So I use these words there. Um, on purpose uh, in the back end uh, as, as separate components, but they end up being uh, morphed and, and combined on the client, which isn't always a good thing, especially when we're talking about programming with mobile apps. So uh, caches, uh, they, they, store, they show up all over computing, if you're familiar, right? Uh, L1, L2 caches and CPU uh, caches in the back end. Um, and and there's, there's also another kind of phrase that you hear very often, that people need to be reminded of, which is uh, caches are not database. And the reason why caches are not databases is because they, raf they lack some referential integrity. Um, and these are, these are different data structures like indexes, B trees, B plus trees, um, 
doing hash joins uh, across different different tables uh, to give representations and 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 these are important because it allows you to have some properties um, such as you might have heard of acid type properties in a system um, and and these properties are important because it allows developers to operate on the da data without having to think about some of these things like making sure that data is updated in both places, the results of your query actually hold true when it comes back to you. And what, what exactly does this mean? Why is, why is this important? Well, um, let me show you a, a bit of a history example here uh, in a couple of slides. And the first is uh, the, the Amplify team, before we, before we worked on data store that I'm gonna talk about in, the, in this presentation, uh, we actually tried another technique, which is similar to most, most customers uh, would go, which is just using a cache as, as your store. And um, we, we, we integrated with, with the Apollo client, uh, if you've used GraphQL in the industry. Um, if not, it's, it's a great client, I'd, I'd recommend looking it up. Um, but it's nice if you're just going to, to have a local cache. Where, where it has some trouble is if you want to start to use this for data synchronization. And you can see here in the image, this is actually a, a view of um, a debugging tool to show what, what a cache usually looks like on a system. Um, this, is, this is in a browser, but it's similar if you were to look at SQLite. Um, it, you, you get basically a reference of queries to the items that represent it. So here's an example, listing a bunch of posts and you get an individual post as a, as a value for one of the keys here that's got the, the author and the title field and things like that. But let's take this a little bit further and bind this uh, to part of our UI and, and see, see where the problems arise here, or one of the problems, I should say. Um, so let's say that I had some query. Um, if you're not familiar with GraphQL, um, I'm not gonna go in, in depth on all the details of GraphQL today, but this is an example of GraphQL query on the left. So I'm, I'm doing uh, a list items here, uh, which corresponds to a data fetcher on my server backend, uh, which could be a NoSQL database, a SQL database, anything. And I'm applying a filter on it. So I wanna return everything that uh, has the category of dog in my list. Now, if I'm offline and I mutate one of the keys there, what's gonna happen is that my app view is still going to be bound to the results of that that query, right? Because that's just a key in some local hash map. It's got no referential integrity. And here I've got a data in inconsistency that I've got to account for on the client. Either I've got to manipulate a query or I've got to manipulate multiple queries with relationships. So this gets pretty rough if I've got one, you know, representative data structure of a record locally and I've got one or more queries pointing to that as well as subqueries. Like I might have a post with comments. It tends to break down pretty quickly if you want to start doing these updates. Now, the other side of this is uh, when you're doing synchronization with some of these updates. Uh, this gets pretty tricky. Um, for example, um, you know, again, talking about just the generalized problem, not any specific Amazon or, 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 or other specific uh, um, open source package tech. Uh, when you're trying to do synchronization over both real-time channels as well as uh, what's called a batch channel, which, which could represent your, your, uh, your offline channel, um, you need some merge operation to happen. So this is another interesting uh, concept that comes from, from our backend systems, not just around consistency, but around updates to data. Um, and this is called a Lambda architecture. It's got nothing to do with AWS Lambda. It's just a general way of, of showing that you have to reconcile data in a specific order. Otherwise, you get inconsistencies in your system. Um, and this usually comes to doing batch operations on your offline or, or, or slow layer and then real-time updates that come through a different channel end up getting hydrated uh, and reconciled through, through basically a merger component. Now, why is this important? Well, when you're dealing with uh, a system that will do both real-time as well as uh, offline updates, uh, you have a bit of a race condition that happens when you're doing client synchronization. So, for an example, um, let's say that I've got one client system there on the lower left, and it's doing, it's loading its data. So in our GraphQL world, this is going to be a query. It starts a transfer at some time T0, finishes at some time Tn. Between this time, there's an update to your data on the back end. This happens by this other client on the right-hand side. 
Well, when this happens, there's a specific way that you have to reconcile this. Um, and in, in our world, we're dealing with GraphQL subscriptions that'll come in via real time. So this will be over a WebSocket channel. And you basically need to enqueue these, these items locally before uh, merging them into a local synchronization operation. And this is just kind of a general concept that you have to, you have to take care of when you're building these systems that have both real time and offline components. And this is only a two-way merge. It's actually a three-way merge if you think of having offline rights like I was just showing in some of your consistent situations. So that's kind of the problem space as a whole and, and the challenges with building some of these apps that we wanted to tackle. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show you the system that we built and how we, we address this with, with Amplified Data Store today. So, so what is Data Store? Um, so this is, this is, as I mentioned earlier, this is a, a category of programming in, in the Amplify framework. Um, and the, the, the way I'm going to talk about this today is specifically some Android code. But um, the idea is that it, it operates the same across Android, iOS, uh, JavaScript, and React, Angular, whatever apps, even, even React Native. And um, it does a, a few key things. One is it gives you a familiar uh, way of programming first. So we call this this local first programming. Um, so rather than you having to deal with the mental overhead of managing a cache and all that state across the client and back end, uh, you just program and operate on your data locally. Uh, Amplify Data Store will handle updating your local store appropriately, both over the real-time channel as well as online and offline sync, so that you don't need to worry about kicking off those actions about doing that reconciling that I was just talking about. And it will do it in an intelligent manner. So first of all, we manage uh, through through GraphQL and through AWS AppSync, we manage conflict resolution and these different concurrency mechanisms in the back end. Uh, we do it in a few intelligence ways. Uh, so we give you some controls from optimistic concurrency control to even a an auto merge functionality to, to union and, and merge fields together. The other thing is that you might be going online and offline in, in, a, in a fast manner or in a slow manner. And you don't always want to pull all the data down to your device. So we give you what's known as Delta Sync to manage the updates to your device. And this is important for different scenarios where somebody might be in, in a, uh, um, let's say like a retail store and they're going just offline for two or three minutes and your system has a lot of high velocity writes. Well, while that's happening and the client's going offline, it might only be interested in a few of them that happened. And it also doesn't want to just keep resyncing the entire database over and over. So the Delta Sync capability allows us to create a change journal on the back end so that we can just target those events that that one device missed and only pull them down. So I'll, I'll go through all of these things now and, and then uh, show you how this, this, this functions a little bit more. So the first is the overall architecture that we built. So there, there's, there's a few components to this, and, and we'll start left to right here, and then I'm going to go through pieces. The idea is that the mobile and web developer just interacts with what we call the data store API. Um, so this is a very friendly interface. You can, you can write uh, your, your mutations, save operations, uh, which, we, which we create in an immutable fashion um, by, by operating over instances of entities. And those entities are what we call models. These models get, get persisted in this storage engine that, that interacts with this data store API. So this happens underneath the covers behind the scenes for a developer. That storage engine has an ad adapter style interface. So this allows us to use different storage mediums with the same architecture as well as programming model. So for instance, on iOS and Android, this is going to be SQLite. React Native, it's async storage, on web it's indexed DB, but we have a few other adapters as well that we've written. You can even, in, even bring your own adapter in the future uh, if you wanted to write one yourself. And the, the important thing here is this gives us a consistent medium so that then we can operate over the network and do synchronization operations. So the sync, the sync engine there is going to interface with that storage engine. It actually does this via uh, an observable. So the data store and sync engine are actually observers of the producer here, which is the storage engine that's, that's appropriately updating them, such as if your application needs to be notified of new data or the sync engine needs to be notified of new writes that happen and it needs to, to reconcile these with the network in the general state. 
So how, how does this work? Um, how do you build this step by step? So the first is the, the idea between behind data store, like I mentioned, is the, the local first programming model. So the idea is that you as a developer just look at your entities. Um, and if you've you've never looked at GraphQL before, this this is actually one of the reasons why we chose to use it. Um, so instead of operating on something Swift specific or something Java or Kotlin specific or TypeScript specific, you just use this generic data modeling, and this is known as GraphQL schema definition language. So that's the the one here in the second where it says type post at model. And the idea is that you you just use this SDL to to give friendly uh, um, annotations to your data model. So here's gonna be a post with a name, content, and rating. You can do relationship modeling as this as well with you know one to one, one to n, m to n. You can you can add authorization rules to this. I'm not gonna go into all those details today, but our documentation covers this in pretty great detail. And you add this into your app and then you run a build phase. Now a build phase can be a few different things. It could be NPM scripts, Xcode build phases, or we've got um, a Gradle plugin that you can install. And you literally just click it down in Android Studio, you run model gen. And underneath the covers, we generate uh, a bunch of classes that uh, get leveraged by data store itself. Um, so in, in the Android world, these are gonna be classic Java POJOs. Uh, we, we actually use a step builder so that you can get some nice a nice interface when you're using a builder and, and only get presented to you the required fields in that GraphQL SDL first. Um, and then your optional fields you can decide to, to add to the, um, uh, to the instance of your class that you're creating it. And the other thing about this that this build process gives us is it gives us this nice fluent interface, which we dynamically generate from all these different fields. And you can layer things like queries or predicates over this, like give me just back the, the posts where the, the rating is really important or greater than five, or give me back these, um, uh, these posts where the name contains Richard. Uh, we can also apply these predicates to mutations as well. And this allows you to apply criteria to your rights. So for example, maybe I want to only run this operation if my account balance is greater than some value, right? Um, this is what allows you to run in this decoupled manner when you're offline and still do writes with a certain offline first mental model. But when it recon reconciles with the backend network, if there is a conflict that occurs in the server, you know, maybe multiple people in an account are writing the same data and you don't want to overdraw, you can get that message back in a callback when, when you actually have synchronized with the network and operate on it appropriately. So what does this data store API look like? So there's a few more methods, but I want to talk about three specific today, which is um, you effectively uh, save data, query data, and observe data. It's really kind of that simple. Um, so for example, um, you can see in the upper, up, upper half of the screen, I'm going to um, query some or write some data by creating an instance of my post. Um, then I'm going to save some data um, by just passing that instance in. But now if I want to query it, I you know, use amplified data store.query. I pass in, in uh, the, the, the class, and here this is some Kotlin code that I'm operating on here. And I can even give a predicate here if I wanted to to, to get back just the, the, the items that I'm missing. Um, and similarly, I can observe some data. And what this is going to do, it's going to open up a web socket between the client and the back end and get any real-time data when I'm actually online on my client. So. Um, um, just to show you this a little bit, um, actually going to pop open here a little Android Studio project uh, that I threw together last night. Very, very simple, not complex whatsoever. And I've got a, an app running here. So um, let me actually clear out Logcat just to make this a little bit easier. Um, the idea is 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 really simple uh, with Amplify. Um, you can just you you effectively we as I mentioned in the first slide we have a um, we 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 have centralized configuration um, so you can pass in uh, basically um, a configuration uh, XML file that we configure through the Amplify CLI you can also manually build it out yourself if you really wanted to um, so if I look down here I've got an Amplify project. 
oops, sorry, scrolled down a little too far, um, that has my entire backend API and everything else set up in here. I have my schema file, my schema.graphql, which has a to-do that I've annotated with that model. It's got name, priority, description. Um, I can even give some non-at model types, uh, such as enums, which are referenced in here. So this priority has a type priority here, which is a enum of low, normal, and high. And then what I would do is I would kick off a model gen task in Gradle and then an Amplify push. And this actually built my entire back, created a local configuration file that then this initialization routine set up. Now, normally I'd probably put this in like a separate class, like a singleton for config, but just trying to keep this, this demo simple here. Then after that, um, I can operate, I can, I can do some things like observe my data. You can see here I'm doing um, Amplify Data Store Observe. Uh, this uses Rx underneath the covers. And I can get information when my items uh, are, are updated by any other client in the network. I can also save some information and query some information. So for instance, this query that I've got here, I'm, I'm just operating on this little amplified data store query that I want to, you know, print out any of my to do's over the network. So that that's really all that I'm, I'm doing in this query. Nothing, nothing fancy. Um, I just want to get all of the, the information. So if I press this guy here, query. Oops. No. Let me clear that out and run that again. Right, it's actually giving me back the, the records here. And I've, I've, I'm actually printing out two records that I've got here. Um, one that I created from the Amplify or the, the, the AppSync console, as well as one that I created locally here. Um, and in fact, if I show you here the console, come over here to the screen. Get a little a list query right now just to show you what this looks like. Give the name and description so you can see those records. All right, so you can see I've got these two records here that are in my system. Um, and if I wanted to, I could actually show you directly in the database as well. But I'm going to omit that for time. Uh, you can check that out on your own sometime. Um, but the other thing that um, would, is nice to show here as well is, is I, can, I can save some data. And in fact, let me just press that little save button here. Right here. OK. Um, you can actually, if I show you that, you can see down here, it actually um, created an item in the offline, offline queue, created a, a local unique identifier for this. And you can see it added the mutation in the outbox and queued it and sent it over the network. The client code for that was just simply all I did was um, I had a, a binding to uh, the um, amplified data store.save. So I created a to do item called go shopping, pick up milk, save the item here. And my save, all I did was amplified data store.save. Um, and I had a successor error callback. Um, just to show you here, if I run the same query on the server, right? I've got this pick up milk and, and it's high over here. Uh, the other interesting thing um, when it comes to real-time subscriptions, just if I could show you a little bit of a toggled window here. Uh, let me see how I can it's around a little bit. There we go. So I'm going to actually, um, because I did a data store observation uh, locally, and I was, uh, I, I actually set up that observer in my uh, my on create method. Um, 
I'll add something from the console to simulate another device. It's a little bit easier when I'm doing it over a webinar here to create a to-do. And again, this is GraphQL. It's exactly what's happening in that, that kind of local sync engine as well. Um, so I'll do a name. It's, uh, on. Description from console. Give this one priority. And I'll send my selection set. Now I'm going to send the ID, the name. description, as well as three key very interesting fields here. This is kind of how we, this is actually what we use again, GraphQL being an open standard to do some of our data, data synchronization as well as our, 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 uh, our Delta sync. So this version is controlled centrally at the server as well as this deleted and last changed at. You notice if I write this, It actually, on the client here, came through. You can you can see demo from the console. DroidCon actually came down lo lower here on the client. And if I clear this out, there we go. And I run that query again. I actually got my DroidCon Italy because it's doing a local query on the device. And it's really this simple. It's even it's even this simple if you were to try to do. Uh, Now add some where clauses in into here. Oops. Sorry. Just having a little type trouble typing today. It should actually be where dot matches, right? You can actually see my query predicate that I pop into here if I wanted to. And I could do something like uh, uh, my to do here. Uh, if I wanted to get over the priority, for example, and now I've got things like equal values between contains and so forth, right? I've got a lot of flexibility that I can operate over my data model. And this is just kind of a, a small little demo of some of the things that you can do um, using the programming interface. But the idea is that we really wanted something that was, was local first and very simple for you to operate over as, as your mental model goes. So. How, how is that actually, what's actually happening there when you saw this running? So the first is, you know, you saw me programming straight against the data store API. Um, and what happened there when I was creating those model instances is they were dynamically on the fly being converted to uh, persistent storage. And, and how this happened was um, when you saw me run that, that build, when, when you show, saw me show you the, the Gradle build process there, and I pass in my instances, uh, what we we actually use is we in on the Android side specifically is we're using reflection there to convert these into what we call a, a model registry or a model repository, and we're we're using reflection to look at the type information as well as the GraphQL schema, and then persist these in the in the storage engine of our choice. Now, on Android there, that's going to end up being SQLite, and what's pretty cool about this is. Forgetting about the what I showed you on synchronizing to the back end of the network, um, you can just do this local persistence without data sync and having no AWS account at all. And this is a really nice thing, and we, we wanted to build this without having AWS requirements so that people could have an easier way of doing offline programming if their apps just actually didn't even need to synchronize. So you can just use this as your persistence layer of choice if you want an easier mental model of interacting locally with your data and, and, and having it persist in a, in, a, in a nice way. Now, when you switch that, that drop down though and go to the Gradle push and you actually have an AWS account that you configured locally with credentials, uh, it will then set up the entire backend for you just from, again, that data model. So you don't have to be a, an infrastructure expert or anything to get started with, with data store, build these things. You still got the full power of AWS if, you, if your business later has those requirements and you want to you know, hook into the rest of it. 
Um, but just all you have to do is you could start locally there, do your data modeling, which is a nice iterative way of getting your application into a nice state. Do that that uh, th that push command in in your in your Gradle action, and then from that we build an entire backend for you. So we build a GraphQL API with AWS AppSync. We hook up DynamoDB tables, um, including a table that has a change journal with with TTLs to do the Delta Sync functionality. Uh, we set up all your your permissions in a fine grained manner with least privilege. If you added more annotations to that data model, like at auth, we'd set up a cognito user pool so you'd have a full user directory do everything. And what ends up happening here, again, kind of following this this flow is, um, as I mentioned, you operate on this data store API. I save an instance of something. Uh, we we use reflection and serialize that into the storage engine so that it's got its model rep uh, registry. It then interacting with this other component in them called a sync engine will serialize this to a GraphQL request like you saw me type there in the console uh, and send this over the network to, to AppSync. So if it's a write, it'll do it as a mutation. If it's a query, it, or it'll, it'll make it a GraphQL query as well, including you know, the, the predicate filters that it'll operate on locally here. And the same thing with subscriptions. As the sync engine starts up, it'll subscribe to the back end so that when any writers from the system send to the back end, um, those will come through over a WebSocket. And the, the reverse process happens as well. When, when responses come back from the network, these are then serialized into the storage engine. Your data store API from your client application is maybe observing on that model. So it will get notified when new records get written to the system as well. So we've kind of got this this all built in uh, in for it, so that you you just program on that local only mental model. Now you might be asking at this point, I'm talking about different platforms as well. Well, these can these can operate in the same manner. Um, so imagine you might have started your application in in uh, in Android here, and and you did this push capability that I was talking about. Well, you can from a different workstation uh, just pull down that 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 those that that uh that package um you can even pull it from a git repository if you want to and and multiple android developers can operate on the same uh shared shared front end um but you can have multiple front ends with a shared back end as well like you could go to an ios system or maybe maybe you're building a web app as well and you do an amplify pull command so this is a cli command that you install and it gets from the back end as well we actually store this metadata in amplify console whenever you do a push uh, just just the metadata of this. We store the the SDL, the, the schema definition language, and it will then run the build task as well. So it can operate on that same shared backend, again, using the same programming mental model and all the same conflict resolution that's handled centrally. So what does this look like, the, the conflict resolution pieces on the backend? How are we doing the synchronization? Well, GraphQL is is what what powers this, right? This is in the the service we use is is AppSync, which is our managed uh, GraphQL service in in AWS, and it's a centralized authority. We actually looked at a lot of other uh, a lot of other techniques. Um, you might have heard of things like operational transforms, CRDTs, other things like this, and they they they're interesting, but they 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 tend to have some some limitations when if you're going to build an application of scale and. And I would imagine many of you are want to build applications that have you know maybe tens of thousands of clients and want to do synchronization. Um, instead, what we do here is we we give you um, a capability to have centralized authority and 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 with AppSync managing what we call loose versions in the system. And these are a way for for it to operate on what it has is is these things called sync enabled resolvers and. And you'll, you'll see if you ever look at the AppSync code for the resolvers, they've actually got this operation called sync. Um, and it manages for each entity, each, each entity's instance that comes through this. Right? So when you create those posts or those to-dos, it's actually going to manage the versions on them. It's going to um, do conflict detection so that if multiple writers are coming through, it will it will know if you are out of sync with the current version that's in the system. So the client actually can't update any of the versions. It has to send in the, the version that it knows about. And then based on if it has a detection, it will go into one of the conflict resolution strategies. And we have three of them that I'll talk about in a minute. We've got an, a form of optimistic concurrency control. 
Um, and, and in that, we mean the last committed write to the database is, is what we consider the current version. Um, we have a, a, a way that you can cut, run custom Lambda functions if you want to, right? Add in your own business logic. And then something else called auto merge that I'll talk in a few minutes. And, and this is a set of heuristics for us to, to make some intelligent choices on your behalf. Now, before we get to that conflict resolution strategies, um, I talk, talked about earlier in this presentation uh, some of the challenges with doing synchronization, um, especially when you've got that, that sort of race condition with offline and offline online sync. And you want to then layer on top of that something like Delta Sync so that you don't have all the updates coming back and forth when your client runs those queries. So these synchronous enabled resolvers, they, they operate in a couple of ways. First of all, they, they do a hydration with which we call a base sync. So at any given time, if you've got no information on your device, you need to fetch it from the back end, right? Um, but you, when you run a uh, data store, it will first kick off this base sync to, to get the results of a query and persist it there in that, that storage engine. But if you're going online and offline, like we had this one customer, Aldo Shoes, based out of Canada, that uh, they, would, they would have runners that, it's basically a, a shoe store that um, that that people would come into the store and and order on tablets the the latest um, shoe that they wanted, and then a runner would go into the back room, and while they're in the front room answering these calls, they would they would get real time subscriptions. But when they go into the back room, they don't have network connectivity. So when they come back out with the the shoes for the the customer in the front of the store, they don't want to just have to rerun the space sync again. So to do this, we actually create a change journal in the back end. And that is when in between the base syncs, which happen on a periodic basis, it's default 24 hours, but you can control it. Um, they will just get those missed updates. And then there's a base sweeper that will, will handle anything that you might have had uh, problems as a global reconciliation me mechanism. It also handles the problems that I mentioned earlier with that three-way merge, right? When, and it does this by um, sequencing the events when they come online. So if I come online, my subscriptions go into a queue I reconcile my back end to get the latest data with a sync using either the base or the delta query. I then will apply any of my offline writes that happen now that I have the, the, the latest data. If something's in conflict, I can run my callbacks. And then I start merging through and processing my subscriptions over the network. Now, this delta sync is interesting um, because you might be thinking, especially if you're a native app developer, well, do 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 I really need this? Could I just keep on, you know, running queries uh, that come onto the network and and uh, just keep applying them locally in my system? And and it's it, it's found even if you have uh, really fast systems that are running at 60 FPS or anything like that, um, to just do this client filtering over and over again and get your missed data, it's it's it is CPU intensive. You'll get flickers in in your UI, um, so it's a bit slow. It also inter in um, inter in, uh, in integrates and and uh, brings to light another consistency issue in your data model, right? Because now you need to start filtering these things out. So you get, it's error prone. So how do we handle this uh, inside data store on the back end? Well, I mentioned we're, we're using these sync enabled resolvers. So um, the, the, the logical system, what it kind of looks like, imagine this is the service managed service in the center with app sync and we've got two DynamoDB tables for for our, our data, our posts on the back end. And we, we always, whenever we do a write, what we do is we write it in two places. So the first one is our, what we call our base table that corresponds to our base sync on the left-hand side. And you can see I've got unique IDs. Uh, I've got um, a few records. Uh, we've got Nadia, Hello World, Poncho, I'm Sleepy. These, these are actually dogs on our team. Um, and so when I do a create post, I'm not only writing there, but I will then always write the record into what we call our delta table. And this is, this is our change journal. And how we key this is a little bit different. We, we slice this into what are called time buckets. And these buckets are keyed by a combination of things. So they're keyed by a combination of the entity, um, the actual version, uh, a, another logical timestamp down to the nanosecond that we put on top of this. Again, I made the joke in the beginning of this call, uh, I had a little, um, timing consistency on, on our part, just me hopping on this call uh, with time zones today. So, so having some of this automatically managed for you is, is really nice because, you know, humans mess up these things all the time. It happens. And uh, then we, we also put a few other things in this record, like the, the last ch changed app field. You saw me add that in the, the AppSync console because I want to send that down to the client. It's managed in the server. 
Um, there's also some other metadata that I don't have on this, such as like if it's deleted. So we'll do soft deletes um, and a TTL as well. And why this is important is when we're creating this information, it goes there. When I do my base table um, or my, my, my base sync and the, get the hydration from it, uh, this allows AppSync to be pretty intelligent on behalf of the client. So the clients, they just send this, this sync post query through. And uh, if they send it without their last changed at timestamp for an entity, which the client's getting from the server and keeping that on the top of a stack, the, that tells AppSync, oh, this client's doing its, its base hydration or its, its, its periodic global catch-up. Um, so it sends it back the items that it needs pat in a paginated form from the base table. But if the client sends through its last sync time, then AppSync's going to be smart enough to say, oh, okay, this is the last uh, record that it got from its last change at time generated in the service. It's going to look at just that time bucket and give it all its latest items from that point corresponding to the specific data model entity. And then on the back end, since we've got these TTLs, uh, the AppSync service can, can do, can, can, uh, can do garbage collection over time on this change journal so it doesn't grow out of bounds. Now the final uh, few slides that I'm gonna talk about, just a, a few more um, on this presentation before we close, is I mentioned uh, we've got concurrent writers in a conflict resolution system here. Now uh, the central authority operating here is, is AppSync and it, it, it actually creates monotonic counters for each one of these items in the service and assigns them to the items as they come through through those writers there and you saw me give a little bit of that in the in the table structure there uh, not only the versions controlled on the base item but but also on the delta table itself and this is a nice way for it to control these things as as they they increase over time now um, when you're going to do a write AppSync will actually use this for conflict de uh, detection to see if the client has drifted uh, from what is is, is stored in the service and it uses this with DynamoDB conditionals on, on update operations. Now, additionally in our system, if you if you investigate more in the Amplify framework on GraphQL, we, we allow you to, to decorate them with another directive called at auth. And the auth conditionals that we use are how you add fine-grained authorization to your types. So things like only allow these rights if the, it's, if the, the owner of an item or a specific group has been um, authorized to do updates on that item. And what's pretty cool and the takeaway from this is, is we do conflict de detection not only on the version of rights and synchronization, but also on the user identity that they're a part of. And we do this effectively by, by doing a, a concatenation of AND operations. And, and if both, if one or both of these are, are, are uh, in, er in error, we won't allow the client to write to the system. And we'll actually reject this and, and return a call back to the client so, so that you don't lose data. You as the developer can still make some choices there at the client and what it should do. But let's say that there actually is a conflict in the system, right? So um, maybe it's just off of the, the base version. What do you do? You still need to resolve it in some way. And we, we talked earlier that we have three specific methods of doing this. The first is a form of optimistic concurrency control. Um, and, you know, there's different industry terms for this. Some, sometimes people call this last right wins, sometimes call it latest right wins, sometimes call it um, first right wins, you know. But the, the, the technical way of thinking about this for OCC is, is actually it's the latest committed right with the correct ver version of the database. That, that's actually what won. Right. Um, and this gets tracked in these different base and delta tables. And it's, and it's simply, you know, if the version is wrong the end of the entity, um, your write's not going to work, and a callback will be sent back to the client. Now, that's nice for some, some basic flows, and, and this might be fine for most of your applications. A lot of people like this. Uh, but we have a couple of other interesting uh, things that you can do. The, the, the problem with some just doing OCC for everything is if you want your logic to change ever, you don't want to constantly be updating your client applications and have to redeploy something to the App Store. So another thing you can do is instead of just doing that base OCC is you can have a custom Lambda as your conflict detection. And what happens here, this is an AWS Lambda function that, that we will pass the, the old data, the new, or when I mean old, I mean the current record in the database that the conflict was detection, detected on, the data that you tried to write from the client, the, the caller identity, um, like you know Richard, for example, comes through, as well as some of the GraphQL type information. 
And what you can do then is you can write your own custom logic in like a, you know, a Node.js function or something that says, you know, if username was Jeff the admin or Lucy, allow it to, to rewrite to the system. And then it will go through the flow. And out of band, if your logic ever updates, you don't need to redeploy your apps. You can just update your Lambda function in your AWS account and, and change it as appropriately as your, your app evolves over time. Really nice for content moderation as well. But there's one final thing that we have here, which is this thing called auto merge. And what's interesting from the system is we're using GraphQL. This was another big reason why we used GraphQL here because we wanted to get some, some type inference and make some decisions on behalf of the customer. So imagine I, I just look at my raw object without the types here. I, I've got, you know, Shaggy, um, he's got an age of six and I know that that's an integer. I mean, he's got a breed of big beagle. I know that that's a string. And I've got two other writers in the system here, client A and client B. And you can see that one client, uh, which is A, is, is updating that age, that, that one field age to 10. And client B is updating the field of breed to miniature schnauzer. Now, because we're using GraphQL here, when these clients write, we can do some type inference and see that the end result can actually be a union of these without losing any context from the system because we know that these are non-overlapping fields. Now, if the fields did overlap between the systems, we, we basically will um, traverse the, the entire AST here. And if we, we end up with a field that, that can't be traversed any further, then we'll apply optimistic concurrency control with the latest right wins on that item. And again, send it back to the client. But this at least allows us to apply some heuristics here and, and make some smart decisions. And it can not only be done on just some, some primitive types like that, but we can even do it on lists. For instance, in this case, uh, Shaggy's actually got a set of interests here. Um, and we can do on lists or sets, so you can choose to, to, to have these deduped automatically or not. Um, and in this case, if I look, if I look at this, this list of toys, I've got two other clients, one that's going to make the interest as cats, another one that's going to make the interest as dinner. And when we um, apply auto merge to this, and we can look at the GraphQL type information and cascade through that, that graph, uh, we can simply concatenate the writes as they came in on that record. So no data is actually lost in the system. So it gives you a really nice way to, to do uh, auto merge capabilities in a scalable way, because the way that we're, we're, we're controlling these with centralized authority, we don't, we don't have to, to, to use um, other techniques and track the state of the system on every single writer. Um, we can apply these heuristics using the GraphQL information and gives, get some really strong consistency properties. So um, thanks for, for hanging on a, a few extra minutes today as we as started a little bit late. Um, hopefully everybody got a lot around this. Um, a couple extra links here for you before you do the Q&A. You, you can always see some more live demos of this. I'd, I'd encourage you if you're interested to, to look at some of our documentation, um, including walking through some of the data store getting started, uh, as well as join our Discord channel, which we've got a lot of members of the, the, the Amplify and larger AWS community, as well as just members in the open source world that are contributing every day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you for your webinar. Um, thank you, everyone, for um, staying connected. Um, our next webinar will be next Tuesday, 23rd of June, on design centric approach. Um, Richard will be taking um, questions just now. The link for Slido is in the message bar, so you can post your questions there. Um, I'd like to once again thank Synesthesia and AWS Amplify for supporting this webinar. Thanks, Richard. Back to you for questions. Well, I'm opening the Slido link right now.